EJ, it's lovely to have you. And um, I must say, I want to start by saying this book, um, actually you can see, Our Divided Political Heart, um, fantastic read. I mean, just a very, very easy, fun, interesting narrative of American history in which, if I were to summarize what I got from it, um, you're really trying to say, it seems to me, that a strong federal government intervening in the country's affairs in the states is not some invention of the 20th century. That, in fact, that, that a strong federal government, even if it's limited, has been part of the American tradition from the very beginning. And, in fact, that it's an important complement to the Jeffersonian or the uh, uh, more libertarian notions of states' rights and individual rights. Am I... Am I reading that wrong? Uh, no, you're reading it right. I, the, the core argument, as I would put it, is that from the beginning of our republic, we Americans have been torn by a deep love of individualism and a deep affection for community uh, that encompasses a belief in the federal government. And the rest of what you said is absolutely right, because I wrote this book partly inspired by the Tea Party, you might say. Yeah. And at the beginning of the book, I actually thank the Tea Party, of which I'm very critical in the course of the book, for uh, encouraging us all to embrace the American story. And I just think they get the story uh, wrong. And that if you go back to the, the writing of the Constitution itself, um, it was not written to create a weak government. We already had weak government with the Articles of Confederation. It was uh, written to write a stronger government, to create a stronger government. Um, and the founders did not create a strong government for it to do nothing. Uh, it's also and of course, Lincoln. Uh, in many ways, the first Republican president fully was the most aggressive federal uh, president that the country's ever had. He, Remade the country. He arguably turned us into a nation. Yeah. I, and in fact, I talk a lot about the um, Republican nationalist tradition, if you will, or our friend Michael Lind would call it the Democratic nationalist uh, tradition, where if you go from, if you believe that small government was the American story, then you have to write Alexander Hamilton, Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln, and a whole lot of other people right out of the Teddy American story. And then later on, um, Teddy Roosevelt. Eisenhower. It's, uh, precisely. Interstate, interstate, interstate highway. highways, federal student loans. In fact, one of the, I, I joke that this is uh, one of the only books you're going to see uh, that uh, pays a lot of attention to Jacob Javits, the uh, late senator from New York, a liberal Republican, who was always asked, what are you doing in the Republican Party? And eventually Republicans asked that question and defeated him in a primary. But he argued that the broad tradition of our party, represented by Hamilton Clay, Lincoln, and Teddy Roosevelt, uh, was a tradition of national action. Yes. Uh, and that, um, you know, and in a lot of ways... Are you saying that both parties have have had both strains within them throughout history? Um, I mean, obviously, the two parties are very different today than they were 150 years ago. But these two strains are endemic in Americanism, right? I mean, so they would affect both Republicans and Democrats. Right. The, I think that there is a great distinction between what I call radical individualism, which is a kind of untempered uh, individualism, and American individualism, which is always about this balance, which, uh, you know, it's worth noting that the first word of our Constitution is not I, it's we. We, the people of the United States, in order to provide for common defense, uh, provide for the general welfare, and so on. Um, and the Declaration of Independence itself, I argue, is a perfect representation of this tension because in the beginning it says we are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then the very last paragraph, the founders pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And uh, the idea, I think the idea of America is, yes, we believe in liberty, but we also understand that defending liberty is a common project. It's a compact. It is. To quote the Mayflower Compact. It, it is. In fact, I, uh, I love John Winthrop's City on a Hill speech, which was made famous by Ronald Reagan, but it is a deeply communitarian uh, document. That's the uh, word that gives me the, 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 the creeps. A lot of people don't like that I word, partly because it's a long word. Why do you no, not like no, I, I just don't. I, 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 I don't want to be communized. I don't want to be told I'm part of a community. I, I have, and one of the reasons I love America is because we don't have to. We can be ourselves, individuals, and forge our own goals without having to ask anybody else's permission um, or get anybody else's approval or give a huge amount of one's earnings over to a central government. That is a, that's what makes America different than 
many other countries. Um, now, it seems to me, and, and, to, and to... Although, to, could to, I make yeah, a, go on, yeah, let me push back just a little bit, which is, um, and the philosopher Mike Sandel has written a lot about this, uh, I don't believe there is an unencumbered self. In other words, I believe we are, there is also no uh, self-made person. First of all, we all have parents, which is actually not simply a biological fact, uh, but, but also a social fact. fact. Um, well, it is That's a natural a, fact. It is a natural fact, but there is a kind of uh, natural underpinning to politics. Yes, which is why Aristotle, <laughs> Aristotle's politics begins with the home. Correct. Uh, and, and it comes out of that. And so I know a lot of people don't like the word communitarian, and yet I think we are the product, yes, of the choices we make, but those choices are made in context. They're yes. made uh, in, often in consultation with and in consideration of other people. Now, someone on the right would say, I think, um, sure, of course we have a federal government that has a strong role, and no one's really, you're putting up a bit of a straw man here in terms of, uh, the Republican Party or indeed the American right being consistently opposed to federal power or the federal government. We know that Republicans love the Pentagon and, <laughs> and that is a big national program which Mitt Romney actually wants to increase large amounts of spending on. Um, aren't you kind of creating a straw man here? Oh, haven't Republicans in fact, in reality, when you, you have a quote from George W. Bush in here which is just staggeringly like Barack Obama. He says, yes, we are a nation of rugged individualism, but we help one another out, and both are part of our American tradition. So the last two presidents have said this. Well, I actually, that's uh, one piece of George W. Bush that I actually like and talk about. Um, a couple of things on this. First, I'm glad you made the Pentagon point because I found during this election campaign that the Republicans are Keynesians when it comes to the Pentagon. They say if you cut the Pentagon, it'll be bad for the economy, and they're anti-Keynesian about every other part of the government. But uh, in terms of the straw man... Although, actually, I, EJ, Romney, I mean, in a rather interesting little aside, said, of course I'm not going to slash spending in my first year. That would tip us into a recession. <laughs> He's actually a Keynesian underneath it all. He's just lying right now uh, <laughs> to keep certain people uh, happy. You, it, it's very hard to know, know. what he stands and for. And certainly Bush was a Keynesian in any, right. any sense. The and the Reagan was too. Yeah. I, that the, the, the point I make in the book is that indeed, not only the Republican Party, but conservatism itself was historically not as radically individualistic as it is at this moment. Uh, and I think there's a real break point at the end of Bush and the beginning of Obama. And I think the that contemporary conservatism, for goodness sake, had some of the great communitarian thinkers. One of Bill Buckley's last books was called Gratitude, and it was about what we owed each other. And Robert Nisbet is a conservative writer I admire very much, who wrote a book called The Quest for Community. So the community patriotism in a way is, is. and patriotism are both very much part of the conservative tradition. I think that at the end of Bush, uh, for tactical and, and to some extent philosophical reasons, the right wanted to, A, disentangle itself from a presidency that was seen as a failure, uh, and B, they were dead set against anything Barack Obama did. Did they also know, in a way, that Bush had betrayed them and everything, and yet they backed him, and therefore, and couldn't still, and still don't really attack him. So they vented all that frustration of eight years of Bush onto this poor guy who picked up well, the There is that, but many of them were explicit in saying, they didn't want to say Bush failed because he was too conservative. So they no, wanted so to say liberal. he failed because he was too liberal. They wanted to say he was a big government conservative, even though a lot of that big government was over in Iraq. Uh, they wanted to say that he spent too much money on, on senior citizens, although they don't really want to repeal the prescription drug benefit. They said he was too much in favor of federal power with no child uh, left behind. And so what they did in the process is, to me, they backed away from some of the most attractive features of conservatism. They backed away from a community-minded conservatism. I'm, I'm, see, I'm already responding to your <laughs> yes. dislike of the word communitarian. And they're backing away from compassionate conservatism. Indeed, <laughs> a lot of conservatives hate that. The other C uh, word that I can't stand. The, 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 I don't, I've never met a government, so I don't know whether a government could exhibit <laughs> compassion. <laughs> One presumes not. But they, <laughs> and so what I think is they back themselves into a situation where all they wanted to talk about was their opposition to government, and all they wanted to talk about was individual freedom, 
And again, I, I, I want to underscore about the book. The book is not saying that freedom is a trivial value. It's certainly not saying that liberty is not a deeply embedded American value. But it's a tempered approach to liberty. Right. And I think in their sort of anger at Bush and a kind of madness at Obama, about Obama, uh, they abandoned the tempered part. Let me present you with, with two varieties of this argument that you're making. And one is that there's a, basically there's a distinction between big government and strong government. And the conservatism has always been comfortable with strong government, at least the British conservatism has right. been. Um, and to some extent, obviously, in terms of foreign policy and in terms of some domestic policies, uh, uh, Republicans also believe in strong government. Let's take crime, for example, in which you have a government that they want to uh, in, in terms of terrorism, too, they, they have basically created and endorsed an executive power with almost untrammeled authority over the citizenry. Um, but isn't it true that to say that, isn't it possible, rather, that you can have a strong government without having a big one? You can say the strong government is necessary for environmental regulation, for infrastructure spending, for investment in common goods. But why should it be regarded as a family in the sense that it provides for everybody's retirement, everybody's health care, um, grows much larger, or is responsible for making sure the market doesn't mean major disruptions in people's lives, or the way in which it has expanded as a share of GDP, the amount of money it takes? Isn't, that, isn't it possible to say, I'm a conservative, believe in strong government, but I still think the big government, especially in the last 50 years, has grown way too big for, for the society to tolerate? Well, it is certainly possible to say that as a conservative. Most conservatives say um, exactly that. I guess, and here I speak, having <coughs> spoken with respect to the conservative tradition, here's where I am still on the center left or the progressive <coughs> side, which is I'd ask the question, um, does it matter uh, that because uh, we have discovered in all of the democracies that unless the government spends a good deal of money, most people won't have health insurance. There is not a democracy in the world um, where the government doesn't spend a lot. We happen to spend a great deal and we don't have everybody covered uh, under health insurance. Um, but no matter how you slice it, government will have to spend a considerable sum in that area. Similarly, why did we create national pension systems in every one of the uh, well-off democracies? It's because some substantial number of people were unable to save enough uh, for their retirement. And so why do we have a big deficit problem? Well, partly we have one because our health system costs a lot of money, which we've got to do something about. And part of it is because the baby boom is aging. Uh, and I would love, as a baby boomer, to repeal the aging of the baby boom. Nothing would make me happier, but we can't. And we are stuck with us for some period of time. Uh, and this will make government loom a few points larger in GDP. Does that actually make us less free? I don't think so. Uh, the metaphor I've always liked to use is, uh, say, uh, Pinochet's Chile, uh, or, or a kind of ideal type of Pinochet's Chile and an ideal type of Sweden. Um, let us imagine a military dictatorship that spends nothing on social welfare, has a very small state, but is very repressive, does not allow free speech, free association, freedom of religion. Then imagine Sweden with a very substantial welfare state uh, relatively high levels of taxation, but complete freedom of speech and, uh, and, and uh, uh, religion and the like. Which nation is more free? I think most people who want freedom would prefer to live in Sweden. And they might want the opportunity to fight against the high taxes, That's but they would have it. And so I think the notion that the size of the state is always determinative of how much liberty you have, I essentially reject that approach. To I, th I, I understand. I think... The, there's a there's a there's a the sophisticated argument. Let's put it this way: is that um, the more resources that are absorbed and spent and decided upon by entities, whether they be corporations or whether they be governments, as opposed to empowering individuals in the marketplace to make their own decisions, the more the collective decisions we end up with are not really going to be the product of our individual choices amassed but the power of either government to corral or, for example, the private health insurance industry to, uh, to rip us off on a, a very large basis. Um, so I guess uh, what I'm saying is that you could have 
a critique of, of, of big government that also included a critique of big corporations and big other entities that, that distort the market, that reduce our freedom as individuals. And that, I think, is where many, uh, a, a different kind of conservatism would come in. I, I don't think we have it right now. But if you see, for example, on a healthcare reform notion that you, if you take what the president said was theoretically an idea in which you got rid of employer-based insurance altogether, you sanctioned healthcare exchanges, you give everybody who couldn't who, a subsidy, and then you let any individual buy any insurance anywhere and have real competition, you would probably have lower prices and more freedom. Well, you than might, you do or, if you're corralled into a, into a, a, a national health care system. You might or you might not, but you would still end up spending a great deal yes. of public money to subsidize insurance for those who couldn't pay the whole yes. freight. And so, again, on your size of state question, but I want to go back to the corporation because I think there's an important point there that I write about in the book, which is another aspect of the American approach has been uh, that we believe in countervailing power. Uh, and that's sort of, it, it's in some ways within the Constitution itself, but it's also a view of countervailing power in the society. We do not want the state to be omnipotent, but neither do we want large concentrations of power, of private power, uh, to threaten uh, the rights of the individual. And so we have used uh, the state at some moments to counter yes. uh, a concentrated private power, which is why the progressives are such an important part of the American story. It's what Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, interestingly, in quite different ways back in 1912, one of the great elections in our history, we covered it together. Uh, they actually, it would have been fun to cover that election. Um, uh, you know, that's what we were talking about as Americans. And in a funny way, you know, when you go back and look at some of the things uh, Wilson and T.R. said, and they seem so remarkably relevant to now. We are approaching the time that the power of high finance will become more than that of government itself, Wilson said. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and so, yes, I think countervailing power is an important part of the story. But again, if you take a purely anti-government view, uh, then you are not willing to acknowledge that there are moments when certain forms of private power can be threatening to the individual. Well, obviously, when um, monopolies cartels, right. rigged uh, stock exchanges, you know, right. insider trading. These things require a government to act to, in order to sustain a free market. I mean, this is an old conservative position, I think. It, it's not the new one. It seems to me that what you're really saying in this book, EJ, is that these traditions have, have really fought for our heart for 200 and odd years, just as they have in different manifestations in other Western countries, because there is always the pull of the collective and the pull of the individual. That's 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 the that's the the tension in this. But that since uh, the election of Obama, essentially, uh, you've seen one of the major parties in this country refuse to accept that one of those strands is legitimate. Correct. That's exactly right. And and. I think that we have been governed under what I call the long consensus uh, pretty much from the time Teddy Roosevelt took office, in some ways right through Reagan and George W. Bush, because Reagan spoke often against, um, uh, against uh, government power, but he did not try to uh, tear down the New Deal, the old Roosevelt uh, which supporter. Which he supported at the time. Uh, which he supported at the time. Um, and that we can have enormous arguments. We can have some of the arguments you and I just had within the framework of that long consensus. But the long consensus was rooted in a sense of balance between the community and the, in the individual, the public and the private, the state and the market. Do you think and, we, and that we are right now, one side of our political debate wants to blow up that long consensus, whereas I think our task um, is to refresh it and refurbish it. And that's what I think this election is ultimately about. Uh, but I think it's part of the argument we're going to be in for some time. And that's why I think you're actually a conservative. <laughs> My <laughs> wife the, thinks the, that sometimes. In the, <laughs> in the sense I would use it, which again has is, is, is rendered me an apostate. Um, but in the sense of the, one of the key words in this book is balance. And at some level what you're saying is, it seems to me, that, look, this is, this is our tradition. I'm not denying the validity of the anti-government individualistic strain. In fact, it's integral to this country. 
What I am insisting upon it isn't the only tradition, and that both sides have actually engaged in the other tradition, which is of strong government, and that one without the other actually fails, that the genius of the West has been precisely to have both and to be able to use both to correct the excesses of each other. That's right. Um, now, that, that's a very, I might say, Oakshadian position, which is that the goal of politics is not the attempt to create heaven on earth or to make us all individualists or to make us all collectivists. It is to maintain the internal coherence of a society based upon its own history and traditions and traditions of thought and to keep the balance going so it doesn't tip too far in one direction or the other. Uh, it's like sailing a boat. But you, you trim depending upon which wind is blowing. Which makes, to my mind, and the, the, oh, this is why I would make an argument that Obama actually is a conservative president. He's saying, and made a great effort to understand and to pay tribute to individualism. He always does. Uh, and then he says, but at this moment in time, for these particular specific reasons, I think we can't do that anymore. We need to do this and this. A, a global recession is one example, it seems to me, of a case where a government can say, we have to do something. We can do something to make this not as awful as it might be, and we will. Uh, so I see him as a sort of balancing act in terms of trying to keep the, but you can't balance if the other side gets off the seesaw, if you see what I mean. You're kind of stuck. Uh, there's no equilibrium. And that's what's at the heart of our political polarization today. No, I think that's right. And I think there are important ways in which Obama can fairly be seen as conservative. Indeed, I think a lot of people on the left see it that way uh, sometime. Um, but, you know, it's funny about, I've thought a lot about of this over the years in terms of you know, what makes one, a, say, a conservative or a radical. And there's a great uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, quote that, uh, and I'm going to garble it a little bit, but it's something like a wise conservatism and a wise radicalism go hand in hand, that uh, a, a wise conservatism not to change the things that shouldn't be changed, a wise radicalism to know when change is necessary to preserve what you care about. And, um, you know, and I think that, that uh, when you're within a, a certain framework of small d democratic debate, the lines aren't always quite so clear between where conservatism ends and where radicalism begins. But where I suppose I'm probably, uh, can be called conservative is the sense that I do respect tradition. Um, and that this book, in a way, is an attempt to reclaim the American tradition uh, from um, folks whom I think are just using it in a way that distorts it and that ultimately uh, could be damaging to us. And, uh, and maybe for both of us in our very, in our different ways, uh, probably a big raised Catholic makes you think differently about tradition. I've had these discussions about politics with people where the word tradition would never enter into the discussion at all. Um, and there's, you know, because there's an instinctive fear that tradition, it can indeed be oppressive, can, you know, and there are traditions we need to rebel against. Uh, certainly in the, in the U.S., slavery and mistreatment of African Americans was defended in the name of a tradition, traditional uh, view. Um, if I can, my... But conservative reform is, is often about changing existing institutions to save them. Yes, no, that's Reinventing precisely Reinventing right. these institutions to save them. Like the monarchy, the modern monarchy was kept by Tories, even though it is unrecognizable in what its powers are today. Uh, because tradition matters, um, and it keeps continuity going. Yaroslav Pelikan, the great uh, religious historian, said that uh, traditionalism is the dead religion of the living, and tradition is the living religion of the dead. And I've always liked that. And that I is, do think is. it's really important to sort of make that distinction between tradition and traditionalism. Yes, and because, to my mind, true conservatism, which is not ideological, which isn't wedded to to the abstract ideology of someone like a Hayek. It is not. <laughs> and Hayek himself would agree. I he called himself a liberal, yes. and he said he was, he wrote an essay, I think, called Why I Am Not a Conservative. And Oakeshott wrote a brilliant essay about why Hayek is, is not a conservative. So they both agreed <laughs> yeah. upon that. Um, but uh, let me give you one situation. George W. Bush announcing TARP. What he says is, this goes against every instinct I have as a free market person, but I am told that I ha in order to save the free market, I have to kind of bail it out. 
Um, in other words, that there are moments in history where, where I think the real conservative says, okay, uh, given the broader, given the other threats to this tradition, I'm going to have to deal with it in a way that would not be typical for someone from the right of center. Because I, I can see that the forces that are destabilizing this are so great that if we were to lose it altogether, it would be much worse than if the government stepped in. I don't like it. I don't want to do it, but I have to do it. In some ways, because Bush never was ushered out of office immediately thereafter, that fundamental point, which Obama simply continued, uh, was lost. That this intervention, this spending, in, 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 in 2009 uh, is, really, is really Bush's. Bush Absolutely. conceded the point. And do you know what's funny? There were only a handful of things that I truly approved, uh, decisions Bush made that I approved of. One is he married a teacher and a librarian, and since my late mom was a teacher and a librarian, the one who's a fan of yours was a fan of yours, that was a good decision. Another was TARP, where it took uh, a kind of courage to go against Everything he had said, everything he had claimed to believe, and I don't think they managed TARP well. I think there were other things that should have been done along with TARP. But if we had not had that intervention at that moment, uh, uh, we could have seen the whole ship go down. And this is precisely and where the Tea Obama, Party disagrees with you, right? And right. Romney would disagree with you, allegedly. I mean, well, though he, he supports, really the, he says he supports the TARP, um, but not the, but not the and not the bailout of the auto companies yeah. and. Uh, I, which I supported. I, I've, I still believe that would have been an irreversible decision to let Detroit, the Detroit-based auto companies go down. Um, but the, you know, this was a, a, this was an aspect of the Bush presidency that probably 30 years from now will get some credit. But people were so angry at him for so many other things, some which I was angry at him for. I was angry at him because, to my mind, conservatism requires responsibility, and responsibility means paying your way. Uh, in other words, I think government should no pay two its wars way, just without like two tax and two Absolutely, tax if you're gonna, if we need to go to war, then we should raise taxes to do it. Uh, you sh and and if and taxes are not an absolute issue; they are a relative. And issue. that's another thing that's happened to our politics, and it's why we can't have a sensible argument about the budget. And that if you restore a kind of consensus where people would say, okay. The core principle of fiscal conservatism is you want revenue and spending to be in some reasonable balance. You and I might have a big argument about whether we are better to go with consumption-based taxes or investment-based taxes, um, and we might disagree about how much should come from the wealthy, but we could broadly sit down and say, we need at least this much in revenue. Let's figure out how to get it. Yeah. And we cannot have that argument right now. The difference between British and American conservatism is that the British want as low, the lowest taxes possible congruent with a balanced budget. <laughs> and the Republicans want the lowest taxes possible, regardless of its uh, impact on debt. No, that's uh, and that's, uh, that's, and that's the, the that's the key difference, because one is much more comfortable uh, with the existence and importance of government than the other. We're talking really about fiscal responsibility. I mean, my, my, my objection to Bush, I mean, I'm in this excruciating position, basically, because I was against Bush publicly from the get-go on the spending record uh, and broke with him over the wars, uh, but mainly because I thought he was overspending. Yet I am actually fine with Obama's spending. And so I'm in the exact reverse of most Republicans. Now, the reason is, uh, it's not that I'm a fair weather person, I don't think I am. I think that the only time when government spending money is more than it takes in, is defensible, is in a recession. That's, I'm an old school Keynesian, but Keynes believed that in good times you should run surpluses so that when the bad times come, you can put money into the economy and not destroy your underlying. And what we've had, and what I think what I would argue in terms of government, we have had a period in which we have spent and spent and spent far more than we can really afford. Um, and what the Tea Party is responding to is that continuing growth of spending along with collapsing uh, uh, revenues. And I think that's a genuine and real issue. They've confused everything with their partisanship. But essentially, they're right. We do need to cut these entitlements dramatically. I think you'd agree with that, right? Well, I'm not necessarily. I mean, I'm not as clear as others are. I think you need to tr uh, trim. It, uh, trim at the edges, but I don't see a miraculous way that you can uh, cut Medicare. 
I just because you don't think Paul Ryan, if you just cut them off at the knees and said, here's the amount of money you can spend and we give you, and if you can't get a decent health insurance, tough. Right, that's exactly what Die. I don't want. And I think that that's a real problem. But the alternative and I think is what? The, the alternative is to figure out how to contain health care costs over Rational. the long run. Uh, well, making a, you know, a, a success-based medicine, there are ways I know, to putting no dollars, one... doctors on salary, substantial salaries. There are other, you have systems within Why the United States. Why don't I believe States. this will really save money? Uh, because the healthcare system has never managed to do it in the past. So right. that's a good basis for believing it. But here's, if I can bring it back to the... the so the why are they, core. aren't they right to worry about underlying expansion of government through entitlements to people? These aren't investing in anything. It's not investing in anything to give granny her pills. It's not investing anything to provide a, a comfortable retirement for all the baby boomers while everybody else is, is on starvation wages and if they have a job. I mean, surely uh, balance would require some move to the right right now on questions of well, entitlement me, spending to particularly. Me, the, the real question is um, how can you ensure a decent retirement to everyone who's worked. That's what the whole point of this system is. And what others might do by saying, let's cut this program, uh, it seems to me that progressive taxation ought to apply to benefits as well as to uh, income. Uh, and so that, in test other words, well, it's, a kind of, it's not a means test really, it's just to say that, I mean, you could say it amounts to a means test, I suppose. Um, but what we're, I am not worried that elderly Americans are getting more than I am now. I'm going to be elderly soon enough. Uh, I, am, I, I do worry that a substantial number of Americans at the lower end aren't, being able, aren't able to live well, even if they work very hard. I worry about those people. If they're old, I worry about those folks. If they're young, I worry about them if they're middle-aged. And so how do you restructure government benefits generally uh, to uh, have a welfare state big enough to provide certain basic things, especially health insurance. Um, and um, yes, some of that's going to have to come out of the wealthy elderly, but it's also going to have to come out of the wealthy non-elderly. And that's I, I don't view it as so much in terms of age as um, having a slightly less distended uh, distribution uh, of income in the country. Not absolute equality, but something close, less unequal than we've developed over the last 30 years. And, and again, to, you know, when I look at the broad, you know, sort of long consensus tradition, um, it was always about the idea that a competitive economy works best uh, in circumstances where large numbers of people have reasonable amounts of money to spend on themselves uh, and their families. We operated on the basis of rising wages for a very long time for the average person. That's much tougher in the new economic climate, but that's what our politics ought to be about. And that, yes, I don't want government to take 90 or 80 or 70 or 60 percent of GDP Just or anything like that. Uh, well, but I do. I already I, pay. I, 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 I work for the government six months of the year. Right. I, 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 I'm, not a, I'm self made in the sense that. Uh, my parents didn't go to college. I'm an immigrant. Came right. here with. Uh, is that is that fair to give up half what you earn? Well, if you earn it, the, the question is. I, I I used to do this, and this is not half, but I used to do this with wealthy friends after the Clinton tax rates came into effect, uh, and I said, all right, you're paying more taxes under Clinton. Uh, at the end of Clinton's term, were you richer after taxes than you were before? And the answer was almost always yes. Yeah. And so the question is, are you more bothered by the fact the government took in a little more, but we were very successful as a country, and so you were still better off even after it's paying those tax It's also true, rates? of course, that to be well off in a country, you require a coherent political order and social order in yes. order to make money. And my, my defense of raising taxes on the wealthy, uh, which I would agree to alongside a broader tax reform uh, is simply that as a conservative I worry about these levels of inequality because I worry about the stability of society and its and its cohesiveness and that we know uh, and conservatives have always said I mean Aristotle be your classic example a society without a preponderant and powerful middle class cannot sustain a democracy in the long run 
That's my argument. It's not a justice argument. It's a pragmatic argument about the stability of the internal coherence of this society in terms of keeping it, keeping it again, bringing it, adjusting it so that it becomes more of what it was. And that's where, I'll bring it back to the book if I may, um, one of the strongest arguments for greater equality uh, is an old American small r Republican argument, uh, which is that people who are in deep, deep need cannot fulfill their obligations as citizens. That a democracy, a democratic republic, requires uh, people uh, to have a certain amount of self-sufficiency uh, and a certain amount of wealth or income uh, in order to function. But there's a and difference the between the wealth of the, those individuals that is earned and the wealth that is simply given to them. I mean, if well, you're talking about most self of the welfare state, I think, we, we, we sort of talk about the welfare state as one big thing. Substantial parts of the welfare state were aimed, it's an old John Stuart Mill line, it's help, aimed, uh, help toward doing without help. And when we think of money to tide people over in bad times, like either Social Security survivors' benefits or unemployment, if we think of help for people uh, to attend uh, university, there are a great many forms of government help that actually promote independence in the long run. I got, when my dad died, I got Social Security for survivors' benefits, veterans' benefits, student loans, and then I got some scholarship. I have now paid back the government, the people, far more than I was ever paid out in benefits. It was a kind of investment in me. So you would have favored welfare reform, for example. I did. Which... I didn't like what they passed because I always thought there was a trade. The trade was it is legitimate to ask people, uh, to want people to work. Uh, and in return for that, we would give people a decent level of support. And I just didn't like pulling out um, the guarantees over the long run. I think you're seeing problems now because you've put those time limits on regardless of whether the times are good or bad. But in principle, I, I actually wrote... But look, the, I wrote for you, this, the underclass, the dependent underclass is as big a problem for liberal democracy as the, the overclass who's sitting there doing oh, nothing, and absorbing I, their wealth, right? No, I wrote an article for... I was the token liberal in the first issue of Public Opinion, which is a magazine that AEI used to put out, and it was an argument for pro-work welfare reform. But it was an argument that said that we have two problems in America, not one. One is we don't have a welfare system that encourages people to work and gives them to the tools to go to work. But two is we have a very stingy welfare state. We actually don't give very much support to the very poor in America. And that the social compact ought to be, yes, we're actually going to give a decent level of support for the poor, but it will be aimed at allowing the poor over time to achieve self-sufficiency. It seems to me that is, again, the balance that we're seeking. EJ, you reveal yourself to be an Oxardian Tory once again. <laughs> <laughs> With a little, and I know that's a compliment. Oh, you. it is. A, it is a compliment. But I, I think the great thing about this book, and I will, I will <coughs> endorse it again, is, is, is it is such a relief to read a writer talking about our ferocious, necessarily ferocious debates, that nonetheless accepts the legitimacy of the alternative position with which you disagree, accepts well, its legitimacy, and I think. My own view is that what's gone wrong with republicanism is an inability to accept the legitimacy of the alternative strain in American political life. And, and so, for example, for me, when Obama won a big victory by any measurement and in the House and Senate won majorities, the fact that the Republican Party was unwilling to give him a single vote on the most important first thing that he was trying to do, the stimulus, was not really an act of opposition. It was an act of nullification that the Republican Party has moved from opposition, loyal opposition, to essentially nullification of anything to do with Obama or the Democrats. Um, and that is a profound political problem. And I think I would argue that the main reason I would support the re-election of Obama is to make sure that that strategy fails and is seen to fail. Because if it, if it succeeds, uh, then there's a huge incentive for the left to delegitimize entirely the right as well. And we are in war. We're not in politics. And the other way to put it is that the right has to change itself and restore itself. And it can't stay on the path it's on. But I just wanted to That's thank you. That's what I'm trying to do. Yes. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for what you said in terms of respect for the other side. I grew up 
in a very politically diverse extended family. And we love to argue about politics all the time. And if we hated people in our family because of our political views, we could never have had Thanksgiving and we could never have had Christmas. No, so it I was know. a lesson the same I had thing. for the rest of my life. EJ, I grew up in a, in a Catholic family. Every Christmas, the entire place was filled with smoke because <laughs> you could barely see from one side of the room to the other, except through the gauzy Christmas lights. And everything was an argument. Everything. And we liked it that way. It prepared um, us for what we do for our work. <laughs> it was a huge training skills. <laughs> anyway, thank you, EJ. Thank you so um, much. Our divided political heart, great narrative of American history, a great tonic to polarization. Cheers, DJ. Thank you. You bet.